don't tell our corporate development investment people that the money is going to lunch. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about telemedicine and whole patient care. I believe that telemedicine is the apex of healthcare in many ways. It's the most distributed, least expensive, uh, it's the most accessible, the best solution for prevention and wellness, for taking care of people at home, the best solution for addressing social determinants of health, uh, and in many ways, the most flexible. Um, so today, we're going to talk about the potential and the promise and some of the realized potential and promise of, of telemedicine and whole care. Uh, I got to UCLA a little more than 10 years ago for, to do a health services research fellowship after doing my residency and teaching myself Linux and, and Python and building some applications. And I was a super geek technophile back then and was really excited by the innovations in telemedicine, all the cameras, the ophthalmoscopes, the otoscopes, the weight, the scales that would be connected. And I thought, this is going to change everything. This is going to be super exciting. And I got to UCLA, and I had just read that there was a Proposition 1D as part of a $3 billion appropriation to the California school system. There was about $300 million given to the UC system for telemedicine. I was thrilled and excited. I thought we were going to do some really great things until someone showed me at UCLA a closet full of monitors, and cameras, and ophthalmoscopes, and there was no way to use them. None of the money was allowed to go for programs, none of the money was allowed to pay doctors, and none of the money was allowed for the connectivity with the kind of remote sites that were going to use this stuff. So it was a little dismaying at first, but the good news is, is that things are changing and things are getting better. And so I want to thank you all for sticking with it, and I know things are still hard and not everyone has 500, has, uh, 500 hours to read all the regulations, uh, but it's getting better. And I think it's here to stay. I don't think it's going to leave. And so all of you are really an important part of this change that's happening. Uh, I really do think things are getting better. Uh, and the proof is really in the fact that all of you are here and the, the market's growing. And the other proof is sort of in the change that we see in, in time, in history. Um, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, as many people say. Uh, and healthcare has sort of followed along in a similar kind of development. So as steam gave way to electricity, which gave way to digitization, which gave way to AI. We see the same sort of patterns in healthcare. So the pattern in industrial revolutions have been to get farther and farther away from the power source. Steam, you had to have a machine right next to the steam engine. Electricity, you had to be a few hundred miles away. Uh, with digitization, you could control something far away. And with AI, you can control many things far away. And healthcare has gotten farther and farther away from the terminal event also. We sort of began 150 years ago taking care of epidemics and people on the battlefield. We figured out how to do that. We started treating chronic disease with really strong medicines and diagnostics and surgeries, which you see represented up here. Amazing work that people are doing. But to me, the real, the apotheosis of all of this is going to be in telemedicine because that's the only place where you can, in the middle there, this tiny picture of a pregnant woman, that's where you intervene. It's not about a procedure necessarily or even a medication. It's about support and about taking care of the whole person. But we have problems still to solve. And some of the problems, you all know probably this chart pretty well. And what's really interesting about this chart, the causes of death, uh, are how many of these components, how many of these diseases have components of them that are lifestyle, behavior, mental health issues. The obvious ones are things like suicide on the bottom and accidents of which half of those, almost se over 70,000 deaths in the US last year, were from overdoses. Lung the cancer, you see, is the second biggest cause of death. A quarter of that is lung cancer, and 90% of that is mediated, caused by smoking. And if you look at diabetes, and if you look at overweight and obesity, it's half of the lines on this page are because of how people eat. And so how do we address those things? How do we start to take care of those issues in a telemedicine context? Well, it's interesting. I got an alumni newsletter, and it showed a, one of my classmates went to Uganda, and he's treating um, the, uh, the Ebola epidemic. And he had this quote about trust was the most important thing. And so I did a little search, and I found there was an, even an editorial in Nature about this. And so if trust is important for Ebola care, this rapid, devastating disease, viral, mediated, where there's maybe a vaccine and there's some treatment really is supportive, then it's definitely a part of the behavioral underpinnings of some of the diseases that I showed you in the prior page. Uh, trust is something that's important to our company. I think trust is important to all of you. And as telemedicine inherits some of the best things of medicine, uh, one of the messages today is to, um, to also inherit that professionalism, that ethic, that sort of responsibility and opportunity to have a relationship with patients in the way that physicians have for so long. Uh, as telemedicine gains in its um, importance, 
that's going to be an important key. But there's a problem, as you know. The problem is that there is disconnection everywhere. There is disconnection between patients, the data, the people, the organizations, uh, and this thing really prevents the kinds of successes that we all hope for. What do patients want? They want everything that you want. Uh, at Hims, it was interesting, uh, we were talking, and no one needs an analogy to Uber or Google or Amazon or all the retail or consumer-oriented companies that treat us so well. This is what patients want. We're spoiled or educated, depending on your point of view. And these are the kinds of things that we want. We want to be understood. We want to be thought of. And here's an example. 180 Health Partners takes care of pregnant women who are addicted to opiates. There's a human story here that's beautiful to all of us. They help women who are addicted give birth to babies that are not addicted. The technology story should be known to all of you. Women have mobile apps. They have counselors on the other end using a console that brings together data from multiple sources. They treat them. They don't treat them with medication. They don't treat them with diagnostic studies or procedures. They treat them with relationships, with support. There's a community of women who are giving birth at the same time, who can all join and give support to each other. And this is classic telemedicine. The business story, though, is also very interesting. They go fully at risk because the difference in taking care of a baby who's addicted to non-addicted is $60,000. And so they can go full at risk. Their customer is the payer. And they have been very successful doing this. And what's also really interesting about this is that this isn't just a technology. The technology that underlies this uh, company is not just for the patients and the counselors. It's also for the payers. The payers get a window into this. So again, it's sort of going around the, the primary care physicians to really serve the patients where they need and the customers, in this case, the payers who are paying the bills. So how do we do this? Bring together data from all the sources. Everyone knows you have to bring clinical data in, claims data in some cases, device data, telemedicine. People get really excited about telemedicine devices. But I want to really encourage you to think about the person here and the engagement. How many text messages is someone sending? What are the questions people have? What are they calling about when they have the question? Because remember, when people call, they don't necessarily think they're going to get an answer to their health care question immediately. They're not going to get cured or their pain alleviated immediately. They want to know that someone cares about them. And for those organizations that you all represent that are able to give people that assurance and that relationship, you'll find yourselves very successful. The second thing you have to bring together are all the people in care. And this is a bigger, this is a bigger list than it's ever been before. Uh, 20 years ago as a family doc, I was trained that I could just do it all myself. Now we know that it takes the payer, it takes the family members, it takes the physical therapy, occupational therapy, primary care, hospital, all these folks have to work together. And the only place that's currently being integrated is in the patient themselves, and they don't usually have the wherewithal to organize it all. And so you have to, if you want to, if you want to enjoy the success, bringing together all these people and being that trusted guide and being that trusted convener uh, serves to your advantage. And then finally, journeys. Um, we don't usually think about journeys in medicine, or we haven't for a long time, or let's see, for a long time we haven't thought about journeys in medicine. People showed up, we treated them, they left, and that was that. But as you all know, the name of the game is not just treating someone in one moment. Even as a company, Salesforce, we're not just selling software anymore. There's a whole raft, a whole constellation of services we have to wrap around it. You have to reach out to people. Um, people probably have been quoting the NPS scores, the customer satisfaction for telemedicine are huge, but the utilization is low. So there's a marketing problem, there's an awareness problem. That's the beginning of the journey. You take care of people one-on-one, -on -one. most people get that, most people realize the importance there, and then at the end, keep the engagement going. Now we have some great tools at Salesforce that allows us to drag and drop these journeys, to record them as libraries, to improve them and to study them. Imagine, there was a question about AI earlier. Imagine being able to really tailor someone's journey to who they were. In the past, we gave people the same care, and which means we gave some people too much and some people too little. Now we really have the technology to guide people toward the optimum journey for them based on who they are, all the different ways that they are, and to improve those over time. So what does it look like? EHR doesn't exist by itself. CRM, customer relationship management, patient relationship man management needs to be added on. Many of you, I think, understand that. Uh, hospital systems are growing to wake up to this reality, the importance of taking care of people before and after, and to build tools that augment the EHR. The EHR is great by itself, but it's not enough. It's not enough to take care of people at home. It's not enough to take care of people before their patients. And so, in conclusion, we have, that was fast. In conclusion, we have a 
great opportunity. We need to treat people for the diseases of lifestyle and the behaviors and the morbidity that it causes. We need to focus on the behaviors, the mental health issues, the loneliness that contributes to those behaviors. And we need to address the complexity that causes so much cost and waste and anxiety in our patients. Uh, and we can do it by serving people in marketing, in sales, in service, when people come for commerce, when people are training, when people need integration, and on mobile apps. And ideally, we can just serve them as whole people. Thank you. I guess uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Hi, very good presentation. Um, so Salesforce Help Cloud, I mean, we've used it as a medical group at Optum, uh, worked really well in a CRM uh, setting when you're dealing directly with patients, as well as with from a provider perspective. How do you bake in the, uh, well, payer perspective, how do you bake in the providers into this journey of care and having, like, how, how do you envision Health Cloud to be that one fabric that connects all? Um, so the question is really around how do payers, how do providers fit into the health cloud schema? Um, interestingly, the first customers, that, some of the earliest customers we had in the provider space, in the big hospital and system space of Salesforce, were using Salesforce in a B2B way to, to build their networks of physicians. When you think about it, the customer of a hospital is the doc in some way that makes referrals to the hospital system. So there's a strong capacity in Salesforce to organize long lists of partners. In this case, it would be the docs that are partners. If they're your employees, uh, then there's a ready-made place for it. Um, any user of Salesforce gets an access to the screens or the patients, so on. So in the same way that some of the call center agents at, at Optum are using Health Cloud to take care of their folks, if they were analogous to the docs and they would use that, if it was a, net, a separate network of partners, uh, there's ready availability for them not only for their data, but also for their access through portals, a product that we call communities. Any other questions? For, yeah. Hey, Josh. So Salesforce you know, is really good at, as you said, sort of you know, finding, getting people involved in a lot of other industries. You know, you've been there for 10 years. You know, what, if anything, have you, you know, have you guys learned works in other industries that might work in healthcare or that makes consumers or patients in healthcare just so distinctly different that's so much harder? For example, people will spend a lot of time going online to research their TVs and their cars and everything else, but we'll just go to the doctor down the street or the whatever you know, ER the ambulance takes to them without the same thought. Uh, what, what do you think we can do better? Um, what do you think we can do better? Um, you know, I got to Salesforce 10 years ago, as Lyle said, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't even know how to spell CRM. I had no idea what it was. Uh, and it was interesting, I pitched an EMR, and I pitched it to Mark. We built this prototype in a few months, and I thought it was cool, doctors loved it, consultants loved it. I showed it to Mark, he said, this is the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. And we put it on the shelf, and he really challenged us to say, we need to be social, we need to be mobile, we need to be open, we need to do the things in healthcare that we're doing as a company outside of healthcare. And so over the last 10 years, I joke that I got sort of an MBA by working at Salesforce because I've seen every other industry transform. Hospitality and retail and consumer goods and all these other industries that do it so well and so easily and we take it all for granted. And I don't think there's anything special. I think that patients, like a lot of people, want to be cared for. I mean, you were telling me yourself that people are, uh, fall in love with your service and they want to move up in complexity because they have someone they, that'll listen to them. Um, we see that all over the place. The, another interesting analog is no one feels a connection to the person who sold them their Nikes. Um, people like Nike and people don't remember the person who sold them their, their iPad at the, at the Apple store. You have a relationship with Apple. And I think increasingly as people feel connected to organizations and less to individuals, it's the organization's responsibility to build those relationships, and they need technology to do it because individuals can't usually carry that, 
relationship in longitudinal format uh, without technology. And so I think there's a lot of analogs. I think it's really similar in a lot of ways. I wouldn't simplify it by saying it's, oversimplify it by saying it's too similar because healthcare is scary and risky and you have to be right. You can't release early and often in the way that you might outside of healthcare. Um, but I think that we're seeing a lot of healthcare organizations, traditional ones, waking up to the need to take care of people in this much more holistic way. Uh, and I think it's a real challenge for them because everything in the history of medicine has pointed towards those big CT scan machines and really expensive drugs and really expensive diagnostics. And this is sort of a shift back to the old days, uh, the really human days. Thanks for the question. And thank you all. Thank you so much.